started like so many evenings, little Jimmy playing after dinner. His mom was busy cleaning up after dinner, and his dad was busy relaxing after a, a hard day's work. His mom and dad were so distracted that they didn't even notice the time, and the time that evening was just getting away. But there's something else that they didn't notice. They didn't notice this, this beautiful moonlight that was outside of those windows. But little Jimmy took notice. This was something that he, he hadn't considered before, hadn't seen before. But it, it, that moon and, and the moonlight coming through the windows, it grabbed his attention. So he gravitated over towards that window and he just was looking out there at the moonlight, looking up at the moon, just in amazement. Well, his mom and dad finally realized just how late it was. So they went over and the mom said, Jimmy, it, it's time to go to bed. So you go up now and get settled in and I'll come in to tuck you in in just a few minutes. Well, it seemed kind of strange to Jimmy's mom that he didn't argue at this time, but he just went straight upstairs to his room. Again, the mom forgot, lost track of time, became distracted, and it was an hour later. She wanted to go up and make sure that he had fallen asleep. But instead of him being sleeping on, on his bed, what she found was him staring quietly out that window, looking once again at the moon. What are you doing, Jimmy? You're supposed to be sleeping. Jimmy's reply was, Mommy, I'm looking at the moon. She said, well, it's time for you to, to go to bed now. So he walked over to his bed and he lay down and his mom tucked him in. He, he looked up to her and he said, Mommy, one day I'm going to walk on the moon. Over the next 32 years, Jim Irwin would spend nights staring at the moon. When boys his age and later on men his age would become distracted by common things, Jim remained focused on one thing that moon 32 years after that first time where he became locked in on that moon Jim Irwin became the eighth man to walk on the moon here we are at the start of a new year this isn't just the the start of any new year it's also the the start of a new decade and it's not just the start of a new year that's the start of a new decade but it's also the year 2020 where we're being relaunched into something someone just tell me what you think about when you hear 2020 exactly the two things that I knew I would hear was vision and Barbara Walters and as a church we, we went back and forth as to what our campaign for 2020 was going to be would it be the the year of vision or would it be the year of Barbara Walters well there was a slim margin uh, when it came to the powers to be uh, as to deciding which we're going to go with it ended up being vision as compared to Barbara Walters so 2020 it's it's not just a new year that began a new decade but it also serves as a year that we as a church are relaunching for greater vision nudge your neighbor and say greater vision it's been said that within the church world in 2020 vision would be the most spoken about topic the most preached about theme and the most often used verse would be the A portion of Proverbs chapter 29 verse 18. It's most often quoted from the King James Version and it says this, it says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Nod your head this way if you've heard that verse before, if you've heard a message on that verse. It's a, a very common verse. And that's the one verse that they said over every other verse within Scripture, that would be the most talked about, focused on thing within the church. Now, I've heard this preached on countless times, this particular verse. And the overwhelming majority of the time, it's, it's considered in some temporal sense. It, it, it's applied to some material gain, something that's bound to this side of of eternity have some vision for this life your career your goals where there is no vision the the people perish so if you want to avoid great loss have vision and if you want to accumulate some some gain you have vision but I want you to tell I want to tell you something this morning when we limit this verse to, to such an application we've completely missed out on the greater meaning of this verse you see the Hebrew word that's translated vision is the word kazon and it means this vision based upon revelation vision based upon revelation so that kind of changes how that verse is oftentimes applied vision based upon 
Revelation, with that in mind, I want to share with you how the, the, the NLT, the New Living Translation, states Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. And it says this, when people do not accept divine guidance, when they don't hear from God, when they don't allow what they've heard from him to affect what they do and what they don't do, vision based upon Revelation, when people do not accept divine guidance, they run wild. So they do this, and, and, and they do that, and, and whatever they do, they give little consideration on how it might affect others because it's a me-centered thing. But when we look at this, and we see that it's accepting that divine guidance, it's vision based upon that divine guidance, it changes everything. Without it, you run wild. You live for yourself, you do whatever you want to do. B portion of this verse, oftentimes overlooked, but it says this, but whoever obeys the law, divine revelation, whoever hears from God, whoever then obeys the law, lives according to what God says. What are they? They're joyful. Brothers and sisters, we live in a world today that's running wild. Not giving much thought to what God has to say about circumstances, situations, decisions in their lives, direction in their life. People simply doing what they want to do. Again, having little concern on how that might affect other people or how that might affect eternal things. And they're also we're living in a world where there's little to no joy. Sad reality is, it's not just the outside world, though, that's running wild. Many times, the church world is running wild. Oftentimes, within the church, people spend little time bending their ear to the things of God, and, it, and instead of that, they're bending their ears to their own desires. What I want to do. This is what I'm going to do. They're carnal desires. Or churches at large, they're, they're bending their ear to culture and what culture says. So their vision is based upon what they're hearing around them or what they're hearing inside of them when it, when it comes to their own flesh as compared to vision that's based upon what God has to say, brothers and sisters, as we prepare to launch into 2020, understand that we as a church must have causone. We must have vision that's based upon revelation. The direction in my life, I've got to hear from God. The decisions I make, I've got to hear from God. What I'm going to do, what I'm not going to do, I've got to hear from God. What we as a church are going to do, we have to hear from God. Now, understand all of that that I just said just serves as a necessary introduction. We haven't even really got into the word yet, so just calm down. Take it just a deep breath. <laughs> Buckle up. We're going to be in for a semi-long ride, but it's going to be a purposeful ride. This morning, we're going to hear from God. We're going to hear from Him by way of His Word. We're going to first look into Luke chapter 4, and we're going to gain some greater vision for 2020. We want to better understand God's purpose for the church as a whole. We want to better understand God's purpose for us as a local church. We want to better understand what we're called to do in our individual lives and what we're called to do as a church in 2020. The passage that we're going to look into here in Luke chapter 4 will describe for us Jesus Christ's purpose. A purpose that was founded upon, grounded in, and carried out by love. For some of you who don't know, it's a, tag, uh, a tagline for Love Action Church. It's love, learn, learn live. So this message this morning is all going to start off with this love aspect, a purpose founded upon love and a purpose that continues today because it's an eternal purpose. Backdrop in Luke chapter 4 here is, is that Jesus had just weeks before been baptized by John the Baptist, the one who was sent to, to prepare the way. Jesus just days before had victoriously completed his showdown with Satan in the wilderness. You know, that 40 days of, of, of fasting. So he's just coming off of that. And we see here in Luke chapter 4, verse number 14, then Jesus returned to Galilee, filled with the Holy Spirit's power. Reports about him spread quickly throughout the whole region. He taught regularly in, in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to the village of Nazareth, his boyhood home, he went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath and he stood up to read the scriptures, the scroll of Isaiah the prophet was handed to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where this was written. Lock in to this. Verse 18. 
The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. For he has anointed me to bring what type of news? Good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that the captives will what? They'll be released and that the blind will. Everyone say the blind will see. That the oppressed will be set free. And the time of the Lord's favor, his favor being his grace, his, his unmerited favor, his divine empowerment, and the time has come. There are a few truths that we need to understand concerning this prophecy. And the first one is this. A, on your outline, Isaiah's prophecy was fulfilled by Jesus. Indeed, the time has come and the time is at hand where the good news, the gospel, has arrived. Where the captives will, will be released, where the blind will see, where the oppressed will be set free. It's, it's, it's here the time has come where people no longer have to walk through life depleted, but they can walk through life with life. Where people can experience victory, the time has come. But we must understand this, the second thing, be on your outline. The prophecy and its fulfillment were spiritual in nature. We're not talking about good news that would only be good news if, if you were a physical prisoner somewhere or if you were physically blind. You and I, I mean, right now, I'm not looking at anybody who's physically in prison, and I don't know that we have anybody here this morning who's physically blind. But if the good news were limited just to that, it'd be good news for you, but I'd be looking over there saying, okay, so what's the, what, what's the good news for me? This is far greater than just something that's got a physical application. What we're talking about this morning is victory made available to one's spirit and one's soul. We're talking about vision made available to one's spirit and to one's soul. Freedom made available to one's spirit and soul. And the only way, the only way, everyone say, the only way, the only way any of that can be experienced is through one whose name is Jesus. That's the vision that we have to have. See, on our outline, is, is if you haven't noticed yet, you take the first letter uh, of each one of those words, and what's it spell out? Vision. Victory is seen in one name, and only one name. The victory that is the once held captive, the once oppressed, now walking in freedom. The victory that is the blind being able to see. Only experienced through Jesus Christ. Verse number 20 goes on in Luke chapter 4 and it says this. He, being Jesus, he rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the attendant and sat down. All eyes in the synagogue looked at him intently. All eyes that had a sense of vision all eyes, some of them knowing that they were spiritually blind and others thinking that they could see when indeed they were spiritually blind. All eyes, some of those people who were in that synagogue who thought, I, I'm, I'm free. I'm already free. And they don't realize that they're being held captive. And others who recognize the fact that I need freedom. All eyes in the synagogue looked at him intently. Verse 21, then he began to speak to them. This is important. The scripture you've just heard has been fulfilled this very day. Verse 22, everyone, everyone who was there at the time spoke well of him and was amazed by the gracious words that came from his lips. How can this be? Isn't this Joseph's son? So that's what Jesus Christ, the only begotten son of God, the human embodiment of God, the literal body of Jesus Christ, that's what he made available at the launch of his earthly ministry. Now, I want us to fast forward. I want us to fast forward past Jesus' earthly ministry. And in Scripture, I want, us to I want us to fast forward past the Gospels. I want us to even fast forward past the launch of the church and into Christ's operating as and through the church. Because we live in a day and age where Jesus, being limited to, to one body walking this earth and walking into synagogues and opening up scrolls and teaching from them, that day ha has passed. But has his purpose passed? Well, we're going to see Jesus Christ's provision. His provision that comes by way of love, a provision that we as the church must learn more and more about how do we attain that 
provision that's been made available? How do we distribute that provision that's been made available? How can this provision be seen in us and be made available through us? Love Action Church, we have a tagline. Somebody tell me what the tagline is. Here we go. We've got to practice that again. Okay, love, learn, and live. All right. Everybody, what's our tagline? Love, learn, live. So the purpose, it's all about that love aspect. Now we as a church, we, we need to make sure we've experienced that. But now we have to learn more about that. So we're emphasizing the learn aspect when it comes to Jesus Christ provision. So again, we're in Acts now, past the launch of the church. Here in Acts chapter 9, we're going to look at one man's testimony as to how he experienced Christ's provision. How he came into his own God-given purpose, living that out. Acts chapter 9, verse number 1, says this. Meanwhile, now the, the meanwhile is while Philip the evangelist is, is preaching in Samaria and, and souls are being saved. People are being baptized. The church is, is growing. It's experiencing that. That's the meanwhile. Great things are taking place within the church. And meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. The church. Right away, we're introduced to this man by the name of Saul. Saul, who, A in our outline, despised the church and desired to put it to death. That's where he's at at this moment in Acts chapter 9 in the beginning of it. That's where he's at in life. All he could talk about, all he wanted to do was to, to shut this organized religion down that he didn't agree with. He wanted to be the one that did it. He, he's like, okay, um, work through me and allow me to shut this thing down. This was a man who was being held captive by hatred. There were people that he could look at and he didn't look at them through the eyes of love. He looked at them with hatred inside of him. He was being held captive by this hatred, by this animosity. He was blind. He couldn't see. This was a man in need of Jesus' provision. This was a man who needed to see Jesus' purpose lived out in his life. So continuing on in Acts chapter 9, verse number 1, so Saul is blasting the church with every breath. He's seeking to damage and destroy the church. So he went to the high priest. He requested letters addressed to the synagogue in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way. He found there. Any followers of the one who is the way, the truth, the life. In other words, any person who has found life and freedom and vision through Jesus Christ, he's like, I want to go get them arrested. So I need some letters that I can take with me. He wanted to, to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. So he sought out cooperation. He tried getting people to align themselves with him. Now remember this, okay? I, I just real quick on me, okay? So remember this. There's something good that's taking place. God is doing some eternal things. And Saul's here being held captive by hatred, saying, I want to shut that thing down, but I want to align people with me. I, I want to get some people to, to, to bend their ears towards me and say, hey, yeah, 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 let's go ahead. Let's go, let's go shut them down. And in so doing, he wanted to enslave those who through Jesus Christ we're already set free. What a sick and twisted man. These people who've experienced spiritual freedom, he's like, no, I want you to be captives. I want you in chains. The fact that he was even available to take his next breath in this story proves that God is patient, that he is kind, and that he is merciful. And what we're about to see proves that God is also loving, gracious, and he sees the big picture. He sees why people have been placed on this earth for eternity. So even somebody like Saul, God's looking down upon him and saying there's a purpose made available through Jesus Christ that I've got to get to you. Verse number three, as he, Saul, was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him. Now remember, he, he, he's hearing this. 
What is vision? It's, it's, it's vision that's based upon revelation. I, I, I'm hearing from something. I've got to hear something. So he, he hears this voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. Now, small l in, in, in Lord here, signifying that Saul didn't recognize this as the Lord Jesus yet. But he did recognize that he is far inferior to this one in the light. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. So you read this, and if you didn't know any better, you think to yourself, wait, I thought he was going to persecute the church. Saul thought that he was just going out there with a mission to persecute the church. And here Jesus himself says, it's not the church that you're waging war against. You're waging war against me. Brothers and sisters, the church is more than just a religious organization or a religious assembly. The church is the body of Christ. And Saul is just now catching on to that. The church is far greater than just a, a group of people with common interests. Now Jesus is continuing on and he says this, Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. Again, Saul, he's hearing from the Lord. He's getting revelation from the Lord. He's getting direction for the first time in his life. He's developing the type of vision that we're going to be talking about this year. A greater vision. The men with Saul stood speechless, for they heard the sound of someone's voice, but they saw no one. Saul picked himself up off the ground. But when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. He remained there blind for three days and did not eat or drink. It's amazing to me. This man by the name of Saul was blinded physically. At this point, he was no longer able to see who was before him or, or what was around him. When it came to the things of this world, he could not see those things. But it's through this time of being physically blinded that he finally was able to see some things spiritually for the first time. Verse number 10, now there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord spoke to him in a vision calling Ananias. Yes, Lord, he replied. The Lord said, go over to Straight Street, to the house of Judas. When you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. Now, here's how we know that things have changed inside the life of Saul. Saul. How his spirit's now changed. How his soul is now changed. Look what he is doing at this moment. That God is, peer, is appearing in a vision to Ananias. Saul is praying to the Lord right now. The Lord is saying, this is what this man's busy doing. He is praying to me right now. Saul is seeking the Lord. He is centering his focus. He's centering his attention. He's centering his energy on the Lord. And as a result, the Lord continues on and he says this, I have shown him a vision, spiritual sight, of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so he can see again. So be on our outline. Brothers and sisters, get this. Uh, Saul, he hears from the Lord. He focuses his attention on the Lord and receives vision. We're not talking about the physical vision right now. We're talking about the spiritual vision that you and I need, the eternal vision that we need. It's the greater vision. Everyone say greater vision. It's the, the, the coming into to one's God-given purpose vision. It's the being set free vision. It's the victory is seen in one name vision. That's what Paul is, or Saul is getting here. Now there's this new character in the story by the name of Ananias. He's a Christian man who is a faithful and, and, and vital member of the body of Christ. A man who's open to whatever the Lord lays upon his heart. And the reason we know that is because the Lord is laying something big on his heart right now. Something so big that it would not be believable unless Jesus or the Lord himself uh, uh, had given him a vision. Like this is that sort of 
big thing. It's unbelievable. I, I, I could not imagine the Lord laying this upon my heart, but my heart's open. And now he sees this vision. But even after that, what do you see here in verse number 13? Ananias, he's like, I'm not so sure about this. He says, but Lord, I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem. And in addition to that, he's authorized. He's authorized by the leading priest to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. And it just so happens that I'm one of those who call upon your name. So he's authorized to, to arrest me, to take me back in, in chains. But the Lord said, go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings, as well as to the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So it's like the Lord saying, go on purpose, Ananias. Go for a purpose, Ananias. Because there is someone who is coming into their purpose. And Ananias, you have a role in this person coming into his God-given purpose. See on your outline. Saul depended upon the church to be the body of Christ so that he could grow into his God-given purpose. Remember Jesus' purpose. Set the captive free, blinded eyes to see. You remember that? Just because we fast forward through the Gospels and into the church age doesn't mean that Jesus' purpose has ceased. It continues on. On. It's still his purpose today. Now, we, what we must understand is that the provision can only become a reality when one hears from God. Brothers and sisters, a, a lost and dying person, they need to hear from God. God uses you as an instrument, but they need to hear from God. They need to see Jesus Christ for who he is. And they also need to make a personal decision to, to make Jesus the Lord of their life. They need to receive salvation. They need a supernatural work. We have to understand that. But we also have to understand that in the church age, and we live in the church age, Jesus Christ works through the church. Thank the Lord Ananias was a man who would go on and he would do this. Verse number 17. So Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, has sent me that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes. He regained his sight. Now that's, that's his physical sight. Spiritual sight, he, he already had that spiritual sight. Then he got up and, and he was baptized. Afterward, he ate some food and regained his strength. Ananias played a vital role in building up this man who in Scripture right now is referred to strictly by his Hebrew name, Saul. But when he was amongst Gentile people, they didn't call him Saul. They knew him by his Gentile name, which is what? I already slipped once and, and, and used it, so it, it, it's Paul. So I kind of ruined the surprise there. You know, spoiler alert back ten minutes ago. Here's, here's Saul, persecutor of the church. Seeking to destroy the church. And now he's coming into the God-given purpose of being Paul, the apostle of Jesus Christ. And it's from Paul's pen that we read these words written from a prison cell to the church of Philippi. Words that reveal to us who and what Paul now lived for as a man of vision. I want you to look with me. Philippians chapter 1. Verse number 12, a, a man whose life was radically changed. He's now saying this, and I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me here has helped to spread the good news. All the trials that I went through, the imprisonment, the being held in, in physical chains right now, God's doing something eternal. A, a man who had set out on a mission to to bring back believers in chains, is now one of those believers who is in chains. And he's saying, I'm seeing something that I wouldn't have seen in that former state. 
In that former state before Jesus Christ, I thought that those chains would have hindered the good news. Now I'm seeing how God can do something spiritual even through physical trials. And he says, I want you to know that everything that's happened to me has helped spread the good news for everyone here in this prison, including the whole palace guard, knows that I am in chains because of Christ. My word, how we as a church need to, I'm talking big picture church, how many need some greater vision. Because right now our purpose is do everything you can to try to get the, those physical changes, those physical struggles. You know, it's, it's a, that better life now mentality. And here the Apostle Paul is saying, like, I know, I, I know. I'm living for eternal and spiritual things. And God is doing something eternal and spiritual through me. The words being able to be proclaimed. And because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here have gained confidence and boldly speak God's message without fear. God is doing something amazing. Skip down to verse number 20. For I fully expect and hope that I will never be ashamed. Brothers and sisters, park there for just a minute. This is just a little bit of a rabbit trail. Make sure that you're living your life in such a way where you're not going to be ashamed one day for how you lived your life. And if you're simply living for the comfort and the convenience of the here and now, there will be a day you will be very ashamed in how you lived your life. But Paul is able to say, I am confident that I will never be ashamed, but that I will continue, everyone say continue, to be bold for Christ as I have in the past. And I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ whether I live or die. For to me, living means living for Christ. And dying is even better. But if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ. So I really don't know which is better. I'm torn between two desires. I long to go and be with Christ, which would be far better for me. But for your sakes, it is better that I continue. Everyone say continue. To live. The in your outline saw Paul who once lived to destroy the church, now lived for Christ. That's all he lived for. I live for Christ. And because he lives for Christ, he's living to build up the body of Christ, the church. And he does this by preaching the good news. He does this by doing for others what Ananias did for him. Heard from God acted upon the vision they received from God. Helped bring about greater vision for someone else. So we've seen how Jesus' purpose. We've seen how, how Jesus' provision became a reality through one man's journey. Now I want us to see how Jesus' purpose and His provision are to continue being realities in people's lives today. How can the message of Christ be delivered? How, how, can, how can Christ be seen today? How can growth take place today? Well, the third thing, the body of Christ's purpose. We got a tagline here at the church. Somebody tell me what it is. Nice, nice, nice. There were some who like right away jumped at it and then there were probably others who was like, I'm going to wait till I hear somebody else say it and then I'll go ahead and repeat that. But that way, we'll, as long as we all know, love, learn, live. The live aspect, what we are called to do today to live out our God-given purpose. Look with me to Colossians chapter 2. The Apostle Paul, he's writing to the church of Colossa. In the previous chapter, he shared with them his, his personal desire for the local church. How he desires that people experience new life in Christ to its fullness. He desires that the church experience that, that type of life that's an abundant life. Where people can look and say, you're full of joy. For what reason? Because I am part of the body of Christ. He emphasized how the freedom is found only in Christ. He stressed the vital importance that the good news of Jesus Christ to the gospel plays in that. We talked about this the other week. The good news of Jesus Christ wasn't something just to introduce you to salvation. It's the good news at work. The gospel should be continually working within you. He challenges them to understand the importance of proclaiming the good news. He shares with them the importance in understanding that Christ 
is the head of the church. He also emphasizes how Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. And that God in all of his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. Now there's an entire sermon series on that. But for now, understand that Christ is the visible image of God. He's the head of the church. So be on our outline. When it comes to the body of Christ's purpose, it's to make certain that Christ is the most visible part of the body of Christ. What Saul needed to see was Jesus Christ. Who he needed an encounter with was Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, you read Colossians chapter 1 sometime if you want your mind blown in a very good and spiritual way. It's amazing. But it's chapter 2 that I want us to consider for a few moments. We as the body of Christ have a purpose to live out. And it's when we live out our purpose that Jesus' purpose will, be, it will continue, everyone say continue, to be lived out today. Colossians chapter 2. Verse number six, and now just as you, you individuals within the church and the, and the church, and now just as you accepted Christ Jesus as, as your Lord, you, you've got some vision, now what are you going to do with that? You must continue. You, you get the picture that we've got this whole continue aspect going on. So since you've got that, that vision, you must continue to follow him individuals within the church, this, get this, individuals within the, within the church, and also individual churches that make up the church at large. We each have a personal responsibility to follow Christ and to continue following Christ. And that goes beyond just going to church on a Sunday morning. There's a lot of people who go to church on a Sunday morning and they're not following Christ. We don't want to be that type of a church. We want to be a church of greater vision so for us if you're here and you want that greater vision let your roots grow down into him somebody answer who's him jesus christ it's christ alone that's where my roots are growing and let your lives be built on him christ and christ alone then and only then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught, and you will overflow with thankfulness. If your faith isn't feeling strong and you're not overflowing with thankfulness, you might want to consider where your roots are growing. And you might want to consider what you're building on. Verse number eight, don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that comes from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than Christ. See, as a church, we're building upon something, okay? Last year, it was that greater theme. We're not going to buy into the lies. The lies are intended to distract us, to get us to fall into the ditch. As, as, as the, the guy who was on that video earlier was talking about, you remember in that little recap video, he talked about, you know, uh, I, uh, this side of the ditch, that is a good point. Probably a good pre, I don't know, you know. But he, he just patted myself on the back. That's, I, yeah, just kidding. Just kidding. That was just a joke. Um, I desire to be humble in front of you this morning. But brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, understand, as we're building upon something, we're a church that we don't desire the, 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 the lies. I mean, that's uh, high, just nonsense. The Apostle Paul, he's like not pulling any punches. It's nonsense. He's talking to the church. He's talking to people who, they've made that profession of faith. Some of them are even possessing Jesus Christ in their lives. And he's saying there are some philosophies that are going to try to get you to live for something other than Christ. Don't be one of those individuals. We're a greater church with a greater calling. And we're desiring this year to have greater vision. Four, verse number nine. In Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. So you 
a church that is made up of individuals that are rooted and grounded in Christ and Christ alone, uh, a group of individuals that are working together, so you also are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. And the Greek word that's, that's translated complete here carries with it this idea of being full. I, in other words, I don't have room for, for anything else. I'm full. Through Jesus Christ, I, I'm full. Understanding that Jesus Christ, right, you know, today he's working through the church. Brothers and sisters, if you have a dysfunctional, distant relationship with the church, you are not full. And you will be buying into some lies trying to get filled with things that will never fill you. But it's through Jesus Christ that, that we can be made complete. Through the very one who all of the fullness of God was in. Who would walk this earth. Who looks at us and says, I have a purpose for being here. And you as the church are going to carry on that purpose. Brothers and sisters, we have the opportunity of being filled to the point of full. When Christ is the center of everything that you are and everything that you do, you will feel complete. You will feel whole. It's as if you're so filled with Christ that supernaturally, He is the one who is seen in you and through you. As a church, we're called to live out Jesus' purpose. As people who are living out their spiritual freedom and people who are understanding what it is to spiritually see. Because we now spiritually see, we also live, to D on your outline, to be the body of Christ. We live in such a way that will get people asking the same sort of questions they asked about Jesus. You remember, they were like, well, wait, wait a second. Did you see what he just did? And, and, and did you hear the gracious words that he spoke? And they asked the question, but isn't that Joseph's son? Like, isn't this just some sort of a common, ordinary person? And the answer to that would be, yes, that is Joseph's son, but it's also the body of Jesus Christ. He's far from ordinary. He's far from just some natural being. There's something extraordinary about him. There's something supernatural about him. He's the literal body of Christ. Fully God. And this year for us needs to be a year where people begin asking similar questions of us. For me, isn't that Earl and Joanne Smith's son? Isn't that just some average dude but by, but by what he's doing, it's not very average things. He's just some common man, but he's living for uncommon things. He's just some natural person who came into this world because a man loved a woman, and now here comes his son. That all makes sense to me, but why is he living for spiritual things? And the answer to that question would be, yes, I am Earl and Joanne Smith's son, but I am also a part of the body of Jesus Christ. There's something amazing that's taking place in me. You can say the same things about your life. Think of your parents and, and, and aren't you that person's son? Or aren't you that person's daughter? And you should be able to answer along with me, yeah, that's the case. That is who we are, but the reason you're seeing amazing supernatural spiritual things taking place is because we are also the body of Jesus Christ. That's what they should see in us as we walk this earth. The visible image of God. Something different about us. Brothers and sisters, it all starts with vision based upon revelation. The revelation of who Jesus is. It, it, it starts with that experiencing the freedom and the vision that he offers and continuing in that until it culminates in Christ being visible in us but yet as we start out 2020 there's a whole lot of captivity and a whole lot of blindness within the body of christ and because of it christ is all too often invisible not because he's ceased to exist but because the church is living out a different purpose brothers and sisters if that's the case of you, you've got to answer the question as to why is it that I'm not living out what Jesus Christ had to offer? And why is it when people look at me, they're not seeing Jesus Christ? 
There's a table up here, and just the same way that we are considering two different things to do with 2020, Barbara Walters or, or Vision, we thought of two different things to do with this. Either I can use this as an illustration for the message, or I can sit here and try to sell you guys on staying for the luncheon by eating a, a meal in front of you. Um, we went with the former as compared to the latter. So I've got a, a box here, but I've also got a, a, a table. Now... On this table sits a, what would you call this? That's at the center of the table. It's a piece of something at the center of the table. What is it? It's a centerpiece. Consider with me that this were the table of your life. And at the center is this centerpiece. Now this put some thought into this, so I used candles, you know, because Jesus is the light of the world and, and all of that. So, um, man, just kidding on that. I want to be humble in front of you. I didn't think about the, the aspect of the whole centerpiece being a light until I put it up there. I was like, oh, wait a second. Light of the world, Jesus. Like, that's, that's really, really good. Um, when you've got a centerpiece at your table, no matter who's sitting at your table, they look at that centerpiece, Right? Even to look at you, they look through that centerpiece. When we came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, the only way that could happen for you is when you said, I don't want anything that this world has to offer. All I want is Him. He's the Lord. At that moment, slate's been wiped clean. You see the white there? There's reason for that too. So we got that, that, that white tabletop. It's just everything clean. That's all that we've got. And the Apostle Paul says, now continue in that. You grow in that. But then there's things that, that happen in life, and some of the things are, are good. Look at that. Cute family, isn't it? Yeah. That one there especially. Beautiful. Um, that one right there, sitting in the back corner. <laughs> life happens, and it's some things, again, are good. Get married, you, you have some kids, and so now our table's, you know, getting full, you know, a, a, a little bit with things other than just Jesus Christ or what have you. And, and then, of course, you know, good things can happen. Word of God, desiring to, to grow in that. Bible can represent just the aspect of I'm wanting to grow in my relationship. Good things can happen. And then there's some of those empty philosophies of this world that says, like, you live for the now. We forget the fact that after as a church, after we've been raptured, we come back for a thousand years on this earth to rule and reign with Jesus Christ. Don't limit your thinking and your vision just to, I've got to do everything while I can on this earth now. You've got a thousand years to be able to come back in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in an environment where Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning. Much better than just living for the, the here and now. And so empty philosophies, things like hobbies. What do you want to do? I, I love basketball, so that's kind of a, a hobby for me. So I put that in there and didn't have room for a big baseball bat. So using this, this little one as that for those of you who you prefer baseball and stuff and then you gotta work a job right so you gotta start your table starting to get a little bit filled here and i got a job that i have to do if you aren't into construction you just pretend that's whatever you do as a job um other stuff you know i gotta i gotta go out there and get a job because i want to make some money look at that Whew. that's a lot of money right there that'll get you nowhere because it's fake and really money in itself will get you nowhere too but um, so there's, there's that. We got stuff that we're going to live with. Now I got to spend my money. Entertain myself. I got some of this stuff going on. And, and today marks the return of the Nintendo Entertainment System that you saw a couple weeks ago. That kind of stuff. Um, I don't have the new system, so I got to use that right now. And we get to, oh, we're filling our table with stuff. And now since we're filling our table with so much stuff, I got to work more hours. I got to get a second job. And now I'm doing all of this stuff. And I'm filling the table. And I got to look good for people. So I got my mirror to see if I can look good, and I got my, um, my uh, makeup basket here, bag, whatever you call it. Yeah, makeup bag. I don't use it very often except for relaunch. So <laughs> here's that. Now it, the table's getting a little bit cluttered, and I got to get a third job now to, to do that. I got to entertain myself a little bit more. I'm getting tired. I'm getting worn out. There's only so many hours in the day. But yet I'm accumulating stuff and stuff, and I'm living for things. And I'm spending my time on stuff like that. 
I forgot I needed a controller to play the Nintendo, so I got to get that out there. I was wondering why it wasn't working. <laughs> and now one of our own worst enemies of today. Whew. Man. Minutes can become hours, can become days that are spent on this thing. Distracting us from the centerpiece. So now since we fill our table with all of this stuff, instead of being locked in on the centerpiece, it's lost in the clutter. What am I living for? What is my focus on? Brothers and sisters, if this is going to be a year of greater vision, I want you to consider that certain things on your table called life need to be removed. There are certain things that don't even need to be on the table. If you're somebody who has ever had vision, you know it inside of you. The Holy Spirit's doing a work inside of you. If you don't have time for eternal things, and if you don't have time to be connected and growing within the body of Jesus Christ, there's stuff that's got to get removed. There's other stuff, though, that has to stay. It's my family. That's not going anywhere. I've got to, I've got to work a job. I've got to be able to, to, to pay some bills. But maybe if I remove some of this stuff, maybe instead of working 25 jobs... Maybe I can limit it to where I can make my ends meet by working one job. Now we need to relax every once in a while, right? We need to have some, some healthy hobbies, but how about making our healthy hobbies hobbies that will contribute to this? Eternal things. <laughs> Kai is starting to love a sport that I never really loved. I love to watch it. Never really loved to play it. But that boy's got a killer swing. <laughs> there might be a day where I might have to learn how to play baseball. So I can have a hobby with him. Go out there and... Is that a good form, Jack? Work on that. That's a hobby where I can do that with my family. This kind of stuff. Man, am I living to bring attention to myself? I mean, there's, some, there's a point where you want to, you know... Look, you're your best to honor and glorify God through the fact that you're a beautiful person. But man, if it's to bring attention to yourself, you don't have vision. Don't need all that money. I can, I can use some of it. But I, I'm, just, I'm starting to clear my table a little bit, so I don't need as much as I, as I had before. I can pay my bills with that. It's a little less distracting when there's less of it. Man, this would be a hard one. Whew. Limit some of that. Clear the table. What is it that's important? Now, this stuff that's still important is all of a sudden a little more clearly seen when the table's not so cluttered. This would be a hard one, too. In case if Kai loves baseball more than he loves basketball, maybe, again, I don't know. Maybe I can talk him out of that. I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. But this, but this kind of stuff, when I'm, when I'm looking at my table of life, and it's been decluttered just a little bit. And now I can see Jesus Christ. And, and as I'm looking at Jesus Christ, His light's able to reflect off of me. And there's something that He's able to do in me to help me be a better husband. To help me be a better father. To help me be a better worker. To help me be a more faithful representation of who I am to be. Jesus Christ and the body of Jesus Christ on this earth. Brothers and sisters, when your table gets full, you're not only losing sight of your centerpiece, but other people will be able to clearly see what you are all about. Do they see Jesus Christ in you or do they just see somebody who just works themselves to death? Do they see Jesus Christ or do they just see somebody who's so infatuated with a hobby? That's, that's all you live for. You can claim that he's at the center of the table and for some of you, he might be. But for some of us, we need to start clearing life's table of the clutter. For others, we need to begin uh, avoiding being detoured or deterred by life's demands. Understand that certain things can just be boxed up so they don't distract you. We need to hear from someone. We need to clear the table. We need to see. We need to clear the table. And the best way for us to be able to do this is to take our theme verse for 2020 to heart. To meditate 
upon the verses that I'm about to read to you. To get the truth so into our thinking that you will live it and that you will breathe it. Our theme verse comes to us by Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, B portion of verse 1. Let us strip off every weight that slows us down. Especially the sin that so easily trips us up. Clear the table. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. Just as Jim Irwin was locked in on that moon and nothing could deter him from his mission, we understand that we have a greater calling and a greater mission than just walking on the moon. What will distract us? What will deter us? We have to understand who Jesus is and what he will do. He is this, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Brothers and sisters, take comfort this morning. Take comfort this morning in knowing that Jesus will see to it that those who are locked in on him will grow and develop into the godly parents that you've been called to be, the godly spouse that you've been called to be, the godly friends you've been called to be, the godly children, the godly youth, the godly church that we've been called to be. Jesus Christ will see to it. The very one who initiated the faith will perfect it within you. But we have to. We have to. Everyone say have to. Keep our eyes locked in on the centerpiece. He'll do that for you. The champion will prove he's a champion. But you got to make sure that you got the greater vision. That I can see the centerpiece. Every single day I see the centerpiece. Brothers and sisters, 2020, accept this challenge. May it be a year where we as the body of Christ grow in our ability to see Christ for who he is. To see our God-given purpose lived out. May 2020 be a year where Love Action Church is seen by all in the community as the body of Christ. Dear family in Christ, may 2020 be a year of greater vision.